Great to be able to be with you and to sing God's praises like that. Uh, it's a great blessing. Uh, thanks so much as well for the welcome. And uh, it's great to be here representing the Bible College of South Australia where I work. Um, I will come back to talk a bit about that perhaps a bit later on. But uh, where I'd like to start with you today, this morning in our time together, is of course digging into the scriptures. Uh, as we've already heard from Carl, uh, God's people love to go deep into God's word. And so that's what uh, it's my privilege to do with you today. Uh, let's pray together as we turn to God's word. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance to gather this morning and to raise our voices in praise to you. Thanks for the chance to bring ourselves together as sisters and brothers and people who are wondering about who you are. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would help us to grow in faith and faithfulness, that we might be more the people who you've called us to be each day as we sit under the word and as your spirit works in us for your glory. So we trust ourselves to you this morning and we pray you give us attention as we consider what you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever met uh, anyone or have you yourself met the President of the United States? Has anyone here ever met the Queen of England? Okay, I haven't either. Um, my uncle and aunt, though, have met the Queen of England. Uh, tell you why. Well, they they live in England, they live in the UK, and they do this weird thing that's been going on in England for about a thousand years, which is once a year they take their little riverboat up the Thames River and they go from the bottom to the top and they count the swans on the river. That's their job. Every year they do it. Uh, why do they do that? Because uh, you might have heard... The Queen actually owns all the swans in England, so they have to be counted once in a year. It's called swan upping. <laughs> so they are the swan uppers, and they have their own library, and they're all, it's all very special. Anyway, this is something the Queen obviously appreciates, because uh, she holds semi-regularly at Buckingham Palace a big reception and a thank you for all the people who've served across the country uh, in her realm. And she invited my uncle and aunt. And so they went with all the people to the garden party uh, and at the right time she came around and uh, they got to meet her. There's a photo in the entryway of their house of them with Her Majesty um, as she thanks them for upping her swans. Um, now, what do you think it's like when you turn up at the Queen's place? Do you reckon when you rock up at Buckingham Palace you sort of pull over, find a park somewhere, you know, make sure you turn your phone off? knock on the door, and she opens up for you and says, G'day, how are you going? And she takes your coat from you uh, and hangs it and uh, says, you know, just, just through this way, come out the back. Uh, do you think it's like that with the Queen? I suspect it's nothing like that. It's security checks. It's clearances. It's making sure you are who you say you are. It's coming in. It's uh, formally being directed by certain people to a certain place. And then as you are in a very controlled environment... At the right time, she will approach you. you. You won't approach her. And uh, you will bow and you'll say, Your Majesty, on the first time. And then every second, uh, every time after that, you call her ma'am. Uh, and you won't ask questions. You will just interact. And it's all very formal. Imagine, though, if she did answer the door and just you know, came. And, and, and imagine if she um, you know, not only took your coat at the door. Imagine if she said, Oh, gosh, it's a bit dirty there. Let me, let me just pull your shoes off for you. And she got down and unlaced them. Oh, actually, your, your feet. A, a, a grubby as well. I'll give him a wash. You know where I'm going at this, right? We're going to look at John 13, the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Now, it's a familiar story to many of us. And so the problem with familiar stories in the Bible is we think this is just what Jesus does. This is kind of normal behavior for him. Uh, whereas what we should be thinking is, this is mind-blowing that he would do this. More mind-blowing than if Queen Elizabeth II got down on her knees and washed your feet. That's what's going on here. But there's a lot more going on too. This is a big story. So I'm going to turn to it. I'm going to read to us John chapter 13. You might like to open your Bibles. And uh, then we're going to have a look at these verses together and see uh, all the things that God has for us today. I'm only going to read verses uh, 1 through 20. Uh, and then the story shifts a bit, and I'll leave that for you for another time. But let me read to you John 13, 1 through 20. 
Here's how this famous story goes. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things to his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it round his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you'll understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do, just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread and lifted his heel against me has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I'm he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. This is at the end of Jesus' ministry. You might know uh, John's Gospel uh, from chapters 1 through 11 is really about Jesus' ministry up in the north uh, of Israel, the region called Galilee. And down south is the big smoke, Jerusalem. And he heads to Jerusalem. And then really the second part of John from uh, verses, chapters kind of 11 through 12 right through to the end are uh, in Jerusalem in the big smoke. And all of this happens down in Jerusalem in about 16 days. So the whole back half of John's gospel covers like this 16-day period where the front half covers three years. So John is really getting us to focus in. And what is, the, what is a lot of what's going on in this little 16-day window, these, these chapters from 13 through to 21 of John's gospel? Well, a lot of it's about this big dinner. We call it the Last Supper. The Last Supper. And this here, this chapter 13 is the start of the Last Supper, where Jesus brings his disciples together and has this meal just with them, not with the crowds, and has some really key and significant things to teach them. And because John was in the room, eavesdropping, well, he was part of the conversation, he wrote it down for us. So we're getting the inner word from Jesus to his disciples at this Last Supper in those moments before he'll die. This is the climax of Jesus' ministry. It's very clear from verse 1, isn't it? It's all coming to a climax. Jesus knew that his hour had come. In John's Gospel, that's a signal. His hour to do the work that the Father sent him for, to die for the sins of the world, to rise to new life. Uh, the Feast of the Passover is coming. The Passover is that great festival from the Old Testament. You might remember the book of Exodus. The people had been slaves in the land of Egypt. They cried out to God. God heard them, sent Moses. Moses, you know the plagues, you know the parting of the Red Sea. Moses delivered them. That's their backstory. That's the backstory of Israel. We are a delivered people, a saved people. And we remember this once a year in the Passover. And Jesus says, we're going to remember it again tonight. We're going to remember you are a saved people people a delivered people this is the passover meal that moment of great deliverance even though they're all together jesus is not naive he knows they're not all on his side verse 2 he knows that the devil is in the heart of judas iscariot he knows that one in the room is not with him but that doesn't stop him from sharing his message and moving his ministry forward this this is part of god's plan 
and Jesus will minister among they're not pure, he will still be forwarding God's plan among them. He has no doubt of God's sovereignty. You see in verse 3, he knows the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He knows God's plans are unfolding in God's ways, even with Judas in the room. And in this context, this last supper, this, this special meal commemorating God is deliverer and we are delivered people. Jesus saying, I'm going to talk to you this last special conversation before I go to die. Not everyone in the room is pure. This is where he gets up to wash their feet. Takes off his outer robe, ties a towel around his waist, gets down and starts washing their feet. You think this is weird, right? It's weird. It's weirder than you might think. It's not just like going to the Queen's house and having Elizabeth take off your boots and, and give your feet a wash. Uh, do you know why? Probably because when you go to the Queen's house, uh, like when my uncle and aunt went to their house, I suspect they had washed their feet already. And I suspect they didn't traipse through mud to get there. I suspect if you did take off your shoes when you got to the Queen's house, you would have put the nice smelling talcum powder on them already. And they would have been as nice as feet get. But in Jesus' day, you walked around wearing sandals. You didn't have nice solid clothes shoes. Walked around in sandals. And it was dirty and dusty and to be plain, it also was not particularly clean everywhere. They didn't have sanitation like we have. They didn't have uh, you know, filtered water and sewage systems and so on. Uh, but animals in the street and mess and waste. And who knows what would have been on your feet? Um, that's why washing feet was a standard ritual at dinners. When people went to people's places for dinner, washing feet was part of it. But it, it wasn't something that the host usually did. The person who usually washed your feet was either yourself, you just kind of wash them, or a slave. You'd have a slave who washed your feet. The guests are here, wash their feet. Slave, that's your job. Slave would get down and do the dirty work. So that's what you might have expected if you were Peter or one of the other apostles, at the, the disciples at the uh, final supper here, that Jesus would have set up someone to wash their feet. But he does it himself. And now the lessons come thick and fast for us. In verses 6 through to 8, Peter gets what's going on. He gets what is obvious to us with a little bit of background we've heard. He knows that the esteemed Lord, the one that they've recognized as the Messiah, should not be doing slave work. Why is this king of kings, the one who we are following into Jerusalem, the royal city, why is he doing dirty slave work? That's not right. And that's why Peter says uh, there in verse 6, he says, Lord, did you wash my feet? You never wash my feet, verse 8. That's not appropriate. <laughs> that's not your job, Jesus. Uh, Peter's motivation is good here, right? His motivation is, I want to honour my king. I, I should bow down to him. I should defer to him. If anyone's washing anyone's feet in here, it should be me washing his feet uh, if we don't have a slave to do it for us. He wants to honour Jesus as king. But Jesus says, you don't get it, Peter. You don't understand what I'm doing. You'll understand later, but you don't get it, Peter. You're thinking like a person of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. I am not a ruler like the rulers of this world. Peter, you need to learn. You see, Jesus is not a lord and king who sees his position as an opportunity for personal benefit. He does not say, because I'm the ruler, because I'm the Lord, because I'm the exalted one, which he is, therefore I should personally benefit from that position. That's what leaders do often, isn't it? They think position equals privilege. And Jesus says, no, it doesn't. Position does not equal privilege in my economy, not in my kingdom. Jesus is a leader who wants to bless and serve. Position equals Opportunity to serve others. Position equals opportunity to serve others. Now, more people in leadership are realising this now. If you read all the management books, the management gurus will say, hey, did you know what? Actually, if you're a leader, you should serve. That'll be really good for your staff. They'll like working for you. And Christians kind of sitting on the sidelines go, well, duh. <laughs> We've been reading this for a couple of thousand years. It's, of course, what we hope for in our politicians, don't we? We get a new Prime Minister, and even though the, uh, the uh, radio and the news programs tell us who won, 
who, who succeeded. It sounds like it was a competition to come out on top. What we really want to hear is who's going to serve, who's going to bless us, who's going to help us, not who's just going to be the champion and the winner, the one who is in a position of privilege, but who's going to take the opportunity to serve. Well, Jesus says even more than this. Jesus says in the second half of verse 8, not only is he the one who seeks to serve, but this strange thing, he says, if I do not wash you, speaking to Simon Peter, you have no share with me. You have no share with me. This is interesting, isn't it? Uh, Jesus is not just saying, hey, I'll do all the dirty work. Um, Don't worry, I can help. Uh, I don't need to... uh, use my leadership for my own privilege, I'll use it to serve you. He's not just saying, uh, my job is to make your life easier. My job is to bless you. My job is to take the hard stuff out of your hands. He's saying, if I don't wash you, you have no share in me. So it's more than just that doing stuff for us that we don't want to do for ourselves. It's him saying, if you want to be part of what I'm doing, if you want to be part of my thing, If you want to be one of my people, you have to let me wash you. Now, clearly the foot washing here, uh, even for those of us who are slow learners, we realise there's more than foot washing going on here, right? This is an enacted symbol. Jesus is symbolising something, showing us something through this foot washing. It's more than just getting dirt off feet, right? There's a spiritual lesson here. There's a spiritual lesson here. And the lesson is about being washed clean from the dirt and the mess of sin. From the dirt and the mess that only Jesus can remove. If he doesn't wash it, we can't be with him. Because a holy and pure God cannot have sin in his presence. So it's not just about getting dirt off our feet. It's about getting sin out of our lives And that allows us to be in the presence of our Lord and to share with him. We can't remove our own moral dirt. The things we've done wrong, the good things we fail to do right, the attitudes we have that are selfish, that disrespect God, all that stuff that comes under the heading of sin. Sin is really just falling short, not being who God calls us to be. We can't remove our own moral dirt. It's almost as though the Bible says, uh, this is so impossible for you. It's like if you were trying to wash yourself and you picked up a bar of soap made of mud, you cannot do it. And the attempt to do it yourself is embarrassing because it just makes you look more foolish to try and cleanse yourself in the presence of a holy God. You can't do it. You need someone else to do it. And Jesus says, only he can do it. If you don't let him wash you, then you have no part in him. Now, this is a real challenge, and I think this is part of the real challenge of the Christian message. It says, to be a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian, you need to be humble. You need to be humble enough to admit, I am dirty. I'm dirty. I'm not actually altogether. I'm not actually someone who really can put forward a a, a good enough showing that I'll be acceptable to God, it's just as I can put forward a good enough showing that I can maybe land a job in an interview or maybe you know impress a friend at a party. You can't do it with God. We need to be humble enough to admit I fall short. I'm dirty. I can't morally present myself before you, and humble enough to say I will let you wash my feet, Jesus. I will let you clean me. We need to be humble enough to say uh, when I rock up at Buckingham Palace, I'll say, "Go ahead, Queen." Wash my feet. I'm comfortable with it. But more. Go ahead, Jesus. Wash me. I I want you to do it. If you have any sense like Peter that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords and you feel like this is massively inappropriate, you have to say, but I'm going to let you do it. Because if you don't, I have no share in you. So Christians need to be (coughs) humble enough. Might feel a bit awkward to be that humble before God and to say, I really, really need you. But it should also make us feel not not just awkward, not just dirty and not just worthless, but actually, at the same time, more loved than we could ever possibly imagine. Actually feel a worth that comes from him that we couldn't conceive of. Because 
That's what he feels of us. That's, what he, that's his heart towards us. He wants to wash us. That's how much he loves us. And that should make us feel pretty incredible. The King of kings, the Lord of lords. The, the creator of the universe wants to cleanse me. He wants me to let him do it. I must be someone special to him. I must be. I must be. So what does it mean? Well, Jesus obviously now today for us is not here to wash our feet. We, we are not, don't physically have the Lord with us anymore. John's Gospel talks a lot about that. We've already seen it at the beginning, haven't we? In uh, verse 1, he said he's out to depart out of the world had come. Jesus has gone. We're now in the age of the Spirit. So he's not here to wash my feet physically. But as I've said, this is a symbol. This is an enacted symbol pointing us to a spiritual lesson. We have to say to God, I can't do it. I need you to do it. I trust you to do it. I put my mess in your hands. I put myself in your hands. I'm yours. That's what we need to do. It's humbling. It's scary. It's also freeing and safe. That's what we're called to do. Well, as if that's not enough, even in this start of the, this uh, supper, when there's so much more to learn in the chapters ahead, uh, even in this foot washing, there's still more to learn. Peter thinks, I've got it, I've got it. But just as he gets it, we realise there's more to learn. So in verses 9 to 11, Peter, kind of, you think he's getting it. He goes, oh, well, in the, if that's the case, then don't just wash my, my feet, but also my hands and my head. That is, oh, I, I need to be washed by you to have any share. In, okay, okay. Wash me all, Jesus. <laughs> and again, it's the right impulse. If I need to be cleansed, don't just stop with my feet, Jesus. Wash me all, if that's how it's going to be. But Jesus says, it's not necessary, Peter. It's not necessary for me to wash all of you. And he starts talking about another powerful symbol. And this is inferred here, but I think this is what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about baptism. Jesus says, when, when Peter says, sorry, uh, Lord, not my feet only, verse 9, but my hands and head also, Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. Jesus is kind of saying, no, Peter, it's not all of you that's dirty, it's just your feet. You have bathed. You are already washed. He's talking about the symbol of baptism, the symbol of washing away all that sin that Christians do uh, as that symbolic memorial when they come to faith in Jesus. And Jesus says, if, if you've received him in baptism, then that's a once-for-all thing. That's a once-for-all thing. That is, Jesus wants to be very clear on this point, I think. And uh, if any of you have got a Catholic background, this might jar a little bit with that background. But this is a really important point that Jesus wants to make. It's not like you keep falling in and out of favour with Jesus, depending on whether or not you sinned and how much you sinned in the last week. Okay? It's not like you sin and become dirty and then you need to be washed by Jesus and become clean again. And then, oh no, you sin again and you become dirty, so you need to wash and become cleansed by Jesus again. And so you're kind of out of the kingdom, into the kingdom. Out of God's favour, back in with his favour. And you're kind of always calculating your sins and working out, am I in, am I out, which way did I go, have I been washed since I sinned or did I sin since I was washed? No. Even if you sin after you've been baptised, after you've come to faith in the Lord Jesus, which we all do, which we all do, even if you have sinned after baptism, after coming to faith in Jesus, you are still his if you believe. You are still his. You still belong to him if you believe, even having dirtied yourself with sin again. You don't fall out. A, a good illustration for this is a child, right? A child is part of the family. Uh, uh, in, a, in a healthy family, in a, in a good family, uh, mum and dad uh, love the kids, and that doesn't change. And sometimes, parents, I want to let you in a secret, sometimes kids don't always do what they're told. I don't know if you've come across that yet. Sometimes kids are naughty. Sometimes kids are rat bags. But you don't say, you're out of the family. When you apologise and we have a reinitiation ceremony, you can rejoin the family. Mm -hmm. So they do that at lunchtime, and then at afternoon tea time, they're you're out of the family again. 
Reinitiation re service will be at 4.30 again today. And then at dinner time, yeah, it doesn't work like that, right? It doesn't work like that. That's not how it works with kids. Kids are always in the family, and when they're rat bags, they're rat bags in the family. They're not out of the family. They can be good at times, they can be bad at times, but they're always bonded by love. They're always bonded by love. So, okay, you say, well, that, that makes sense to me as well, but, but that just takes me back to the original question. Why does Jesus need to wash our feet if we're already clean and we're not out of the family? Like, we have a contradiction going on here. Jesus says, you need to be washed, uh, otherwise you have no share in me. And Peter says, okay, wash me. He goes, no, you don't need to all be washed, just your feet. Well, hang on. Is it that I need to be washed to have a share in Jesus? My, that is my feet washed, that, that kind of cleansing. Or is it that I'm baptised and in the family and never out of the family? There's two things going on here. I don't get it. Well, I think the answer here is just this. It's, it's not that you need your feet washed symbolically. You need to come back to Jesus for cleansing and refreshing because you're out of the family. It's that part of the dynamic of the family, part of the dynamic of the family is this constant movement of humility and forgiveness and repentance. That's what it means to be in the family. It is a family who come to their heavenly father as humble, penitent people constantly receiving forgiveness. That's the family vibe. That's what we do. And that makes a bit of sense, doesn't it? Uh, the rhythm of our family lives involves saying sorry and involves reconciliation and healing. And it's the same with the Christian faith. The Christian faith is not set and forget. It's not like, got forgiven, got baptised, declared my faith in Jesus, now I can just live my life however I want, uh, and I never need to look for God's grace or face my sins ever again because it's done. No, that's not right. And it's also not in and out. I'm in because I just got washed by Jesus. I'm out because I sinned. I'm in. I'm out. It's neither of those things. Those two models are bad. What it is is I'm in because the grace of God brought me in and I was washed clean when I declared Jesus Lord and Savior and bowed my knee before him. I was baptized. And how I live in is by being constantly rewashed by him every day. I live in the, the overflowing love of his grace. I live in the daily recognition that I'm not worthy of him, but he always says, I'm cleaning you, I'm cleaning you. You're clean and I'm cleaning you. You're clean and I'm cleaning you. That's the family we're in. That's the dynamic. It's not in and out. It's not set and forget. It's in and grace ongoing, ongoing cleansing. It's a pattern of that forgiving recognition. So it means on the one hand, you don't have to fear that every fault means rejection. If you're a follower of Jesus, you don't need to think, man, I realised the way I spoke to that person the other day, that was sinful, that was inappropriate. Oh my goodness, am I out of the kingdom? You don't have to live in fear that you're going to be rejected from the family for every mistake you make. But at the same time, you don't take sin lightly. At the same time, you don't say, it's only breaking a small law and whatever, I'm saved, so I'm safe. It's neither of those things. We don't think every fault's rejection, but we never take sin lightly. And many churches really set up a great pattern to uh, remind us of this through one of our own rituals. We don't wash each other's feet, but we do another thing that Jesus instructed us to do, which was communion, to share the Lord's Supper, to come together as believers, but as people who constantly need that washing with his blood, that feeding on his body, uh, that, 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 that cup that we take that symbolises the blood shed for forgiveness of sins, not to wash dirt off the outside, but to drink it and, as it were, to wash us on the inside as it runs through our body and cleanses us from inside. And we do that regularly as believers, don't we? We regularly take that cup and eat that bread to remind us that we're in. There's no fear of being thrown out of the family, but we take our sins seriously. We're washed clean but we keep being cleansed by him over and over again. That's the pattern of our life. Please be uh, careful, though. Of course, the rituals themselves never make you clean. Verses uh, 10 and 11. Not every one of you is clean. He knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. Judas is in the room. 
Judas presumably had his feet washed by Jesus. Judas was there, as we know, dipping bread into the bowl. He was part of this family gathering with Jesus and his disciples. He wasn't clean. He went through the ritual, but his heart was not right before God. Uh, You could be the kind of person, I, I pray that none of you are, who comes to church, who goes through the rituals, takes the Lord's Supper when it's offered, stands up, sings the songs, but in your heart, you have not accepted the cleansing of Jesus. I pray that's not you. Rituals, I want to say, are very important. I'm not anti-rituals. Rituals are fantastic. Jesus gave us rituals. But they must point to a reality. Rituals symbolize and capture and enact a reality. And if the reality is not there, they're empty. They're hypocritical and they're meaningless. So don't think you can just go through the rituals like Judas. Remember, Jesus is washing our hearts, not just refining our patterns. Well, we've already had a lot, but there's just one more big lesson I want, to hear, uh, I want us to hear from Jesus today. Verses 12 through 17. He says it's necessary for us to understand what he's done for us. And we keep learning and we keep studying the scriptures and we keep trying to understand more by his grace. But he's not just our teacher, but also our Lord. You notice that little flip? He said, you call me, verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and so I am. But if I'm your Lord and teacher... You learn from me and you call me Lord. But if I'm your Lord, then learn from me. And here's the last lesson. And it's a really important one as well. It's not just that he's given us this information. It's not just that he blessed us and he has uh, this kind of gift for us, which he does. But he says, verse 14, If... I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. We need to do for each other what he has done for us. We need to do for each other what he has done for us. Just as he would stoop down to serve despite his position, our lives should really be about serving each other. Even if we're leaders, especially if we're leaders, because leadership is not about privilege, leadership is about opportunity to serve. We should stoop down and serve each other's each other. Now please notice, serving each other does not just mean doing nice things for each other. It might mean doing some nice things for each other. But it's not just being nice to each other. It's not just um, being friendly. It's not just uh, even nice practical help like, you know, Can I bring you a meal when you're sick? Or do you need me to help you with this thing or that thing? Those things are great. Don't get me wrong. But it's not just being nice to each other. Serving each other means serving each other spiritually. Spiritually. Yes, please take people meals when they're sick. Yes, please go and offer to mow someone's lawn if they can't get out there and do it. Or whatever it is you do to serve each other. Please help stack up the chairs or whatever's required at church at the end. But also, but also, please point each other back to Jesus. Please point each other back to Jesus. Serve each other spiritually. Serve each other in eternal things. Please help your sisters and brothers to be in that dynamic of forgiveness. Please help your sisters and brothers to be humble before the Lord, seeking his forgiveness and certain and assured of that forgiveness given to them. Please encourage and help them to forgive others. Please be a community of people like Jesus, serving each other in spiritual ways. This is really challenging again because we really live in a very independent society and we often see dependence as weakness. Who are the people who get welfare checks? The people who haven't got their act together, the people whose lives are mucked up, the people who've got some kind of problem that I don't have. But that's not the dynamic of the Christian faith. I think this is really hard. There was a time many years ago when my wife and I found ourselves out of work. And uh, we were really struggling. And we had some friends who said to us, quietly, didn't make a big show of it, they said, look, while this is your situation, any bill you get to your house, electricity, gas, whatever it is, water, stick it in our letterbox, don't open it, and it's dealt with. That was great. 
That was really hard for us. Really hard to receive that. But we need to receive from each other. We need to be humble enough to say, I am dependent on you. Not just to pay my bills. I'm dependent on you to tell me, brother, what you did the other day was not great. I think you need to go back to the Lord and you need to pray, uh, repent and, and ask for forgiveness. You know, Brother, I saw that you repented and asked forgiveness to the Lord. Why are you down? He's forgiven you. You belong to him. We need to do that for each other as he's done it for us. It's hard, but that's what it means to be the people of God. Not just for an hour on Sunday. That's our lives. That's who we are. That's what it means to be God's people. I want to say uh, one last thing, and this is where I will actually slip into saying a couple of things about where I work at the Bible College. For some people, serving Jesus and serving each other might take a particular form. And that particular form might be offering yourself up to serve in what we call vocational ministry, to make Christian service your life and your job. My hope would be that in a group as big as we are here, this many believers, there would be a few of you who would be thinking that thought, should I give my life to serve Jesus? Uh, it, it might be that actually you're already on the path to doing something else. You know, I'm training to be a school teacher or a nurse or I've got a, a great job at a shop that I really love um, and I can see myself being in there for a few. That's great. But that's no reason not to think, should I put those things aside and actually give myself to serving the Lord as what I do with my whole life, as my job, as my career, as my calling, as my vocation. Uh, I would hope so. I would hope so. Uh, and if you want to do that, then again, this is where the promotion comes in. You'll need to be trained. You'll need to come to a Bible college. You'll need to learn the Bible. You'll need to learn theology. You'll need to learn ministry. You'll need to go deep, as we've already spoken about. Not in a different doctrine, but just more and fuller and a formation that will allow you to then go out and serve the Lord with all of that training behind you. So I'd encourage you, we've given you some flyers that you'll see. There's one that says, come for a class at the college. Uh, you're welcome to come along and sit in the back of a class and just see what it's like if you're interested. Uh, just a great way to start testing the waters. You can contact us anytime. The bigger brochure there just gives you all the general information about the college where I work and teach and where we try and form people to serve in gospel ministry as a way of life. doesn't mean you're going to be a senior pastor necessarily somewhere, though you might be, but it might be that you're going to be someone who's committed to the Bible study ministry, or even saying, you know what, in a couple of years, I could even head up the Bible study ministry for my church, or being an elder, or being someone who says, uh, I actually want to be more fully involved in the outreach programs of our church, so I should get myself more prepared to do that more fully. Uh, whatever it means, if you want to serve, uh, we'd love to help you get trained. And uh, if it's not you, then maybe it's someone you know. Maybe you think, man, this isn't me, but it's so much. Then serve them spiritually. Tap them on the shoulder. Have a conversation. Ask them if uh, that's something they'd like to do. Uh, we'd love, of course, your support for us uh, in other ways uh, so we can keep doing our work. We rely on your prayers. We rely on financial support. We teach at university level. Uh, we teach bachelor's degrees, masters, PhDs, but we don't get funding like universities because the constitution in Australia says you can't teach theology in a university. That's why we have Bible colleges instead of teaching the Bible at university. That's fair enough, but it means we rely on the church to support us. And every student who's gone through, one third of the cost of training them has been borne by sisters and brothers donating to us. So we appreciate that too. Anyway, I'm going to leave that to you. Uh, the brochures are there. Enough advertising from me. I don't want to get off what we're talking about today. We are talking about serving one another. Whether or not you're trained to do that, it's just meant to characterise all of our lives. Serve one another as Jesus has served us. Again, verses 18 to 19 at the end. Jesus knows not everyone will be part of this. Some will only do the rituals. But lots will do as Jesus has done. And lots in the world, in history since this day, have done what Jesus has done. And here's a great bit of news just to close off. Whoever receives the one I send, this is whoever goes off being a servant like I am, whoever uh, makes their life about serving the Lord in whatever capacity, if, if someone is, receives that person, they receive me, says Jesus. And if they receive me, they receive the one 
who sent me. Anyone who accepts Jesus accepts the Father because Jesus shows us the Father. And while we cannot wash people clean, we can and should point them to the only one who can. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we are washed from our many sins and shortcomings and failures. And thank you, Lord, that he calls us to stay in that relationship of forgiveness, of repentance, of washing, of cleansing. You don't, uh, Father, um, you know that we don't change in entirety in our entirety the day we come to faith, although we are radically translated from this world to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but you also don't leave us. You keep